Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is profits under Cournot competition. In the last lecture, we studied what happens in equilibrium in a Cournot duopoly game. That is, we derived the equilibrium quantities of production for two firms. What we haven't yet done is explore the implications of that equilibrium. We're going to rectify that here, beginning by thinking about the profits that each firm will take home. But we're also going to do a deeper comparison. We're going to think about what would happen under perfect competition and what would happen under a monopoly. And that will give us a better sense of how competition affects profits and various other outcomes when we have firms competing over quantity. Let's get to it. And to start, we actually need to do a little bit of review about what we learned in the last lecture. So we assumed that we had a price function that was equal to some constant A minus the total quantity of production Q. And if we have that, then the profit for any given firm is going to be the price times firm I's quantity of production minus firm I's marginal cost, again, times its total quantity of production. We also derived that the equilibrium of this game would be for firm one to produce A plus C2 minus 2C1, all divided by three, and firm two would produce A plus C1 minus 2C2, again, all divided by three. If you're confused where this is coming from, you just hop back to the previous lecture, you'll get all the answers you need there, and you can rejoin this lecture here and now. Okay, well, if we have the equilibrium quantities of production, we essentially know what's going to happen in the equilibrium of the game, so we can calculate the profit by simply taking those equilibrium quantities of production and moving it into the profit function. Let's do that for firm one. So firm one's profit is its price times the quantity of production minus its own marginal cost times its quantity of production. But we actually can figure out what Q1 and the price is going to be because we know what's happening in equilibrium. So first, let's think about that price equation. That price equation is just A minus the total quantity of production, Q1 and Q2. So that's how we get from line one to line two. And then now that we have everything in terms of Q values, as well as those exogenous parameters that are given to us ahead of time, A and C1, to get firm one's profit, we simply take what we had learned in this previous slide, the equilibrium that we had calculated in the last lecture, and we just stick in those Q1 and Q2 values into the second line here. If you do that, you get, well, a lot of messy algebra, but if you do the algebraic manipulation carefully, make sure you don't screw up and make any sort of silly mistakes as you're going along and trying to simplify that line, you eventually get to firm one's profit as a plus C2 minus 2C1, all of that squared, and then divided by 9. A couple of quick comparative statics here. You'll notice that firm 1's profit goes up as firm 2's marginal cost of production increases. That's because firm 1 is able to exploit that weakness from firm 2. But you'll also notice that firm 1's profit declines as its own marginal cost increases because it is becoming weaker. So that is firm one's profit. Firm two's profit is very easy to go from here. That's because firm one and firm two are mirroring one another. All we need to do is flip-flop the ones and the twos and the subscripts where appropriate. And if we do that, then we're left with this. Firm two's profit as being A plus C1 minus 2C2, all that squared, and then divided by nine. So you can see that there's this nice mirroring between firm one and firm two, I'm just flip-flopping those things, and that's how we get to those two firm profits. Okay, great. So we know what's happening in equilibrium, both in terms of the quantities of production and also in terms of the profits in a Cournot duopoly. The next step is to think about what's going to happen in this game versus what would happen with a monopoly or what would happen with perfect competition. And to facilitate a comparison, I wanna think about having identical firms here. So rather than having the firms have unique marginal costs of C1 and C2, we're just going to have a single identical marginal cost C. 
And if you do that, then you're taking all of the C1s and C2s that we've looked at in previous slides and also in the previous lecture and just replacing them with a value of C. If you do that, then the per firm equilibrium quantity that is going to be produced is A minus C divided by three. And the per firm equilibrium profit is A minus C squared divided by nine. So with that second bullet point, we can actually see that in the previous slide. So if we look at firm two's profit at the very bottom, that last bullet point, if you make C1 and C2 equal to just C, then we have plus C minus two C. So that just becomes a single minus C, which is why you have the per firm equilibrium profit here as A minus C squared divided by nine. And because we have two firms, if we sum things up, the total equilibrium quantity produced is two times A minus C divided by three. And the total equilibrium profit is two times A minus C squared divided by nine. Now that we have that, let's do some comparison. First, let's compare this to perfect competition. So again, we just copied and pasted the duopoly outcome up top. Total equilibrium quantity is two times A minus C divided by three. Total equilibrium profit is two times A minus C squared divided by nine. Well, if we think about what would happen under perfect competition, if every single firm in existence, and there's an arbitrarily large number of them in perfect competition, with all of those firms out there, then as long as there is any sort of revenue to be gained, any sort of profit to be gained by entering the market, another firm will enter the market and produce some stuff. Which means that the only way that you have no firm willing to change its total quantity of production is if every firm is producing so much that the marginal value of producing another quantity is exactly equal to the marginal cost of production C. And so that only arises when the total equilibrium quantity produced is A minus C. Why is that? Well, think about what the price function is. It's A minus the total quantity produced. So if you take A times, or rather A minus A minus C, the price of the good in equilibrium here is just C equal to the marginal cost. So under perfect competition, the total equilibrium profit is zero because the firms are collectively producing enough to make the price of the good C, which completely offsets its marginal cost of production. So the conclusion here is that duopolies are bad for consumers and good for producers at least as a comparison between duopolies and perfect competition. Under perfect competition, we're getting more production, driving the price down, which is good for consumers and bad for the producers. Okay, so now that we have that, let's move on to what happens under a monopoly. And to figure out the comparison to a monopoly, we first have to think about what's happening with the monopolist optimal production which means we need to go through another sort of first order condition to figure out what a monopolist would want to do in equilibrium. So in a monopoly, the profit that a monopolist is going to face is the quantity A minus Q times Q minus CQ. There are no ones and twos in the subscripts floating around here because there's just a single firm. So if we do a little bit of simplification, we just multiply out the Q and then we take the first order condition. In other words, we take the derivative of that profit function and set it equal to zero, and then solve for the value Q, the choice variable Q, we see that the monopolist would want to produce A minus C all divided by two. And if you take that equilibrium quantity that the monopolist is going to produce and you substitute it into the profit function, well, you get that second to last bullet point on your screen there. And if you clean up the algebra, you eventually get to A minus C squared divided by four. That is how much the monopolist is going to profit. Okay, now let's compare that monopoly outcome to the duopoly outcome. The total equilibrium quantity under a monopoly is A minus C divided by two. You'll notice that the total equilibrium quantity produced in the duopoly is two thirds times A minus C instead of one half times A minus C. So there is more being produced under the duopoly than there is under the monopoly. And because more is being produced, it's not going to surprise you that the total equilibrium profit is going to be higher under a monopoly than under a duopoly. The competition 
between the two firms and the duopoly is driving them to produce more stuff, which is driving down the price and thus driving down the profits. And so you can see that because the total equilibrium profit is two ninths times A minus C squared, which is less than one fourth A minus C squared. So the conclusion here is that duopolies are better for consumers and worse for the producers as compared to a monopoly. Think about what's happening here. This is essentially a prisoner's dilemma. Duopolis would be better off by having both of them cooperating on whatever the monopolist production quantity would be. So in other words, if the duopolist could think about what a monopolist would produce and then have that be the total quantity of production, so take maybe the monopolist production divided by two and have each of those duopoly firms produce that quantity so that the sum quantity is equal to what the monopolist would produce, and that would maximize the total profits available. The problem is, as we have seen in the last lecture, is that the individual incentives that each of the duopolist firms face make such cooperation incredible. The reason being is that if I know that the other firm is going to produce half of the monopolist quantity, I don't want to produce half of the monopolist quantity in response. My best response is actually to produce a little bit more because I can produce a little bit more and get more profits for myself. So this is a prisoner's dilemma because what ends up happening for the firms is an overproduction in quantity and less profits. Obviously that's good for the consumers, but it's not good for the producers. Well, a natural question to ask then is how might these firms try to resolve their prisoner's dilemma? If they see that there is more revenue and more profit to be made, how can they try to go get that given the concerns of the prisoner's dilemma, that individual incentive to defect and produce more goods? Well, one solution would be for one of the duopolists to buy the other duopolist and create a monopoly. Obvious problem there, of course, is that in most of the world, such a practice would be illegal. The government would look at that purchase and say, no, you can't do that. It's not allowed. An alternative solution is to form a cartel. Now, again, that is usually illegal around the world, but it's much harder to enforce a tacit cartel than it is to enforce the purchase of a company. When you see the purchase of a company, the government can easily intervene. When you have a tacit cartel, it's much harder to see that the firms are intentionally cutting back on their pricing or on their quantities produced so that they can exploit the consumer and bring in more profits for themselves. Of course, even if you try forming a tacit cartel, you still run into this problem of the individual incentive to defect. And so what we're going to be exploring in the next lecture is how those cartels might be able to overcome that problem and self-enforce a lower total quantity of production so that they can extract the full rents that a monopolist would be getting. Hope you enjoyed this lecture and hope to see you next time. Take care.